came back, did you? Not enough chills last time to stop your heart? Well, you know what they say. If at first you don't succeed, turn up the current and fry fry again. <laughs> Tonight's guest is a filmmaker who's really feeling his oats. He's going against the grain, you might say. You might also say he's flaked out. His name is Peter Hatch, and he's really out to bowl you over. Now, let's welcome our infernal host, Damascus Mintzmeyer, and get on with the damn show! <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That never gets old. <laughs> That's a great intro. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, and welcome to The Damn Show on Critical Blast. I'm your host, Damascus Mintzmeyer. My regular host, RJ Carter, is in solitary confinement in my dungeon. Uh, but I've allowed, I've allowed him to keep uh, his computer uh, so he can jump in in case there's any technical difficulties. Um, with us tonight is uh, Peter Hatch from Deformed Lunchbox. And uh, he's uh, got a Kickstarter campaign underway uh, to fund his first full-length feature film, uh, Serial Man. And tonight we're going to spend an hour talking about uh, grainy old-school 8mm horror, uh, serial killers, and Captain Crunch. So uh, first I want to thank you for being here on the show. And um, uh, I would like to begin, I'd love to begin every interview with this question, which is, uh, who are you, what do you do, and why do you do it? Wow, that's deep. Uh, thanks for having me, by the way, on the show. Uh, my name's Peter. Uh, I like to make horror movies. Uh, mm -hmm. The past few years, it's been short horror, but trying to do a bigger feature film. So I'm a filmmaker uh, or film producer. Um, and um, what, what was the third question? Why do I do what I do? Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know. I just, I, I like to make the movies that I would want to watch and I like to make people uh, scared or disturbed or confused, uh, especially when they are people who like, like horror movies. When you get to those mm -hmm. people, you've really done something good to mess with those people. Mm -hmm. So I, I, some, some part me. I like to make movies that are entertaining, but also I like to mess with people a little bit too. So. All right. That is an excellent answer. I'm one of those horror fans. I'm a, I'm a huge horror junkie. I've, uh, I watched The Howling at age six and been addicted ever since. I nice. uh, never really looked back. Um, so let's see. Uh, tell us about your proposed feature, Serial Man, and where the idea came from. Um, well, it's funny. A lot of times the ideas will come from short films. So mm -hmm. I, write, I write a lot of short films, and then sometimes the there's a short that'll just kind of stick in my brain, and I'll be like, oh, this is real, something here. And I had a friend, his name's Craig, and he's at, he's actually only in high school, graduated. Mm -hmm. just graduated. And he was like, hey, man, I need to make a short film. Uh, I, I don't have any ideas. Uh, he had some 30-page script. And I'm like, dude, that's so long. You're not going to be able to do this. Uh, do something small, tight. And I'm like, let me write you something. So I, I don't know why. I think I was eating cereal at the time. Uh, and I just wrote a little <laughs> tiny short thing about a guy who – um eats cereal and then he eats, eats to the point where he throws up and then he like i, I can't remember the short exactly what happened. i think he cuts his finger off and sends it in the mail um <laughs> but anyways i sent it to him he never ended up making it and then some months went by and i'm like oh there's something interesting about this this guy and, oh yeah he had something in his basement that he had tied up uh mm -hmm. to the floor and he was feeding him cereal and i'm like there's something really creepy about that and disturbing and sick uh and mm -hmm. i'm so i'm i took it upon myself and I'm like, let's tell, let's tell this whole story. Let's find out, uh, you know, why he's obsessed with cereal. Let's find out where, what his background is, where he gets his captives, how, how he operates, who he mm -hmm. is. It's kind of a character study in a way. There's a lot of plot, a lot of victims, a lot of characters. And I usually try to take something that is a, uh, seems like a ridiculous idea. Uh, you know, a guy who's obsessed with cereal and, uh, you know, captive, keeping people captive and feeding them cereal. And I try to take that ridiculous idea and make it as serious as I can. Uh, mm -hmm. So it still is a little funny, but um, it's actually not funny in a way because it's it's actually serious. He's he's had serious trauma that's led him to have this uh, compulsion with eating cereal, gorging cereal, and uh, you know just what ha who his parents were, 
Where did he get mm-hmm. all the cereal? Where does he get the milk? It really tells <laughs> everything. And it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, I feel like it could happen. <laughs> so uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's where this idea came from. It, and it just develops, right? You write the first draft, you, you write the second draft, you, um, we shot a short film for it that you can watch right now. And that, that spawned more kind of um, ideas and notions of where it can go. Um, so it's just, it always, it's like, a, I always like to use the, anal- I love analogies and I like the analogy, mm-hmm. like a little snowball. And you start with just a little snowball and it just rolls and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, you <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to get uh, RJ. Can you uh, can you find the uh, Serial Man uh, short film? Um, it's all, it's if you scroll down the page on, on Kickstarter, there, there's one there. We also released a trailer today on mm-hmm. uh, on Instagram, oh, excellent, and TikTok and YouTube. So there's a, there's a th- forty second version as well. Oh, excellent! I watched uh, the I watched the Serial Man uh, short short movie. That was uh, nice. I really liked that one a lot. It was really yeah. good. Yeah, it's creepy. Eh? It's something something like it almost feels like it's it's actually happening. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I like to think it's a little bit of a bridge between like the found footage uh, and a little bit of like more of the creepy pasta, like the skin mm-hmm. uh kind of tonal uh, horror with something that is a little more of the found footage and, and plot driven. Uh, I'm trying to like merge those two, but also be something that's not just disturbing and creepy and mm-hmm. uh, but also tragic and interesting and you you feel bad for him you feel bad for the characters uh in a in a human way so i'm trying i don't know i'm trying to i'm trying to do a lot with it but uh yeah here we go this is yeah this. there we go let's watch this all right <laughs> A little bit, there's a little video at the end of me yeah, talking great. doing the Kickstarter. I like that. What I really like is on the on your uh Kickstarter campaign page how you say you're going for the uh like the 90s, like that that rough sort of shot on video aesthetic, and you really get that sense there of like the grainy old school eight millimeter and the shot on video uh a look. It's it's full really on, that. it's full on uh shot that that was all shot on an analog uh video camera. So it was from a camera from probably, I don't know, mid-90s. 
mm -hmm. uh, and I just transferred it. So it does, it actually has that, that feeling. Um, and then if we, hopefully if we land the Kickstarter, uh, it'd be shot on a mix of that analog video and eight millimeter film. Um, mm -hmm. And then also, you know, there's certain things that analog cameras and eight millimeter film couldn't do as easily or at all, which is like things like slow motion. So mm -hmm. beginning the slow-mo of the serial falling, uh, we had to right. reshot that on digital and then transferred. And I want to, you know, get some drone shots and then mm -hmm. transfer that to analog. So there'll be certain things that are more um, modern, I guess, but using those kind of old formats. I just... There's something very creepy about it. I mean, I grew up with VHS, uh, you know, oh, yeah, me too. video store before Blockbuster mm -hmm. was even popular, at least where I lived. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, we rent a VHS and you get that plastic box. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The big I, I clamshell think, case, right? Yeah. Totally. And I, I really think it'd be cool to uh, even get like a special edition or something and release this on the actual VHS. Mm -hmm. uh, I know something. most people don't have VCRs, but. With old movies like that, like. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like Evil Dead, um, like old school trauma films, you get that, it's almost like a documentary-like feel. Like it has like a, that, that, that low grade video feel, gives it like a, almost like it's oh, somebody's deranged home movies or something, which is kind of the feel you're going for with this, and I like that. There's something about um, like watching a horror movie that's like 4K, high resolution, mm -hmm you know, really mo modern camera techniques, stylish lighting that actually, mm -hmm. I mean, I love those kind of movies. Like I, I recently mm -hmm. saw Evil Dead Rise. I thought that was great, mm -hmm. but it's a different feeling. Right? It doesn't have that um, hit you in the nostalgia feeling. It doesn't have that mm -hmm. kind of rustic old feeling to it. Uh, and I mean, I, I don't know if you've seen Skin Marink. Um, mm -hmm. It was another Canadian filmmaker uh, who made made it. And it's, it's very different. It's very, uh, mm -hmm. it's very tonal. I want to say it's like a tonal film where it's, Mostly about the tones and the and the feeling, less plot driven. But mm -hmm. uh, it was it's very analog feeling. The sound and the era was nineties, and I gotta say, like the, it just got to my core a lot. It really creeped me out a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, there's something about this lo-fi horror, and even like you know maybe you've seen Backrooms. Oh yeah. Uh, so that kind of blew up, and I think there's this kind of new. I mean, I love horror a lot because it's it seems to be the only genre that has like so many subgenres, right? We've got right. Yeah, it is very um, diverse. Torture porn and slasher and, and mm -hmm. all sorts of these subgenres within it, even art house horror uh, or, you know, even psychological. Um, and I feel like there's this new one. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's like the lo-fi horror. And it's a mix of mm -hmm. what this kind of creepy pasta uh, movement online and these creepy videos that feel real. Uh, and I think there's a way to bridge that into feature films using you know really uh, still with strong plots and characters and you know strong editing it's not like we're it's not a youtube two-hour youtube video <laughs> taking some of those techniques and some of that, that feeling you get the experience of watching something that's like a vhs you just saw on the shelf and you put it in you're like what is this um there's a have you ever seen the movie august mortem underground have you ever heard of it i've heard of that movie yes um, so, okay, I gotta say, it's the only horror movie that I've actually had to turn off because it was so mm -hmm. disturbing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, try, I, I, I implore you to try to watch it. It, it basically, it looks like it's a, it's a videotape of a serial killer. Um, you know, I might be, I might be a little off here because I didn't finish watching it, but it's, mm -hmm. it's as if a serial killer is taping his own victims as he's torturing them. Right. And it's so real feeling. It's so disturbing. Uh, and, and it was so disturbing, I had, to, I had to turn it off. Like, I couldn't even get through it. But I think it left a profound impact on me, just that kind of style, the styling. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think there's something truly... I don't know if there's a lot of... With a lot of horror fans like you and I watching, you know, like mm -hmm. a more modern horror film, um, mm -hmm. I, don't, like we, I think we're, we're getting desensitized a little bit, right? Um, Probably. Know, Conjuring Part Four, uh, and they got uh, you know Insidious, and like those, those you know, I, I like those kind of movies, um, mm -hmm. but for a different reason than actually like mm -hmm. the kind of thing that makes me unable to sleep. Um, the last, the last movie I saw that was really disturbing to me was it was called the uh, The Dark and the Wicked. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw it. I think it was on Shutter, um, but that was sure really, that. really disturbing mm -hmm. for me too. I really like being disturbed because it's like mm -hmm. this. I, it's like this brand new thing. Oh, I didn't know I could be disturbed by that. Like backrooms really disturbed me. Mm -hmm. Skinner Rink really disturbed me. So I'm, I'm all I'm trying to find that thing that is uh, disturbing. 
So, mm -hmm. yeah. There's, there's a movie I just watched uh, not too long ago. It's a 1983 psychological horror film from Austria called Angst. I don't okay. know if you've ever heard of that movie. I feel but, like I've uh, heard of it, but maybe I need to see it. Yeah, I think you need to see that one. It's, uh, it's a very, very disturbing film. You would enjoy that one. Okay. Yeah, you've never heard of that one. I'll check it out. No, um, angst. A N A N G C S T kind of thing. Yeah, A N G S T. Yeah, thanks. A N G S T. I'm gonna literally write that down right now. All right. Sweet. The trailer. If you watch the trailer on YouTube, very disturbing. Okay, I like it. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's take a moment and uh, go through the uh, the Kickstarter. Uh, go through everything on the Kickstarter. See what everyone. See what they're going to get. See what they're they're putting the money into. Sweet. If they choose to invest in this, let's just walk everything. Walk us through. Uh, walk us through everything here. Okay. Well, I mean, for starters, I actually added something today, um, mm -hmm. and I don't know why I didn't think of this before. But if you pledge for any any level, you get to mm -hmm. watch watch the, uh, an exclusive pre screening of the film, like a pre release screening. So we'll do like oh, cool. a live. A live screening, you know, the ninety minutes uh, for even the even the five dollar pledge, and that's five dollars Canadian. I don't. Are you guys Canadian, by the way, or no? We're American. Okay, so I think I think five, our, yeah. is, is even less. I think it's like three dollars and seventy five cents or something. I know it says five dollars mm -hmm. here, but um, mm -hmm. that's five dollars Canadian. I think um, mm -hmm. so. It should be less, anyways. Um, yeah, so that's our lowest tier, five dollars. You get the uh, your name in the credits, and you get to the screening, uh, and then we kind of just go up from there. And every every tier includes everything from before. So, the, I'm glad you have it here, so I can remind myself. Uh, this one gives you your name in the special thanks, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, fifteen, and then and then what's the next one? Twenty five. If you keep scrolling down, I can you can see uh, this one gives you exclusive access to behind the scenes. Uh, we have a lot of tiers here, uh, and then you can get a early access to a trailer. And this is the, this is where you start to get handwritten, uh, individualized letters and drawings from the serial man. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have uh, like him in character writing letters to everyone who pledges this amount. Mm -hmm. And there might be little drawings on it. And I mean, he's not really literate, so they're gonna be very interesting letters. Uh, the character. <laughs> Um, this one, it gives you a signed copy of the script, uh, as well. And, um, this next tier, I think you start to get the, this is where you get, uh, where, let's see, signed copy of the script and you get an executive producer credit. Uh, the next tier is where we start mailing you like a big package. Um, and it's a little higher cost, but it's, you know, we gotta, we gotta be sending this all over the world or you're going to get a box of cereal that was used in the movie. <laughs> and then all these things that you get in the other ones would actually be hard copies as well. You'll get the digital copy of the letters and the script, but then you'll get a kind of like a package in a, in a, um, in a cereal box sent to you, no matter where you live in the world. It's not just a America, Canada, uh, shipping. We, we, it'll be shipped no matter where you live. Um, and then the next one, the next tier up, you get a Blu-ray or DVD of the yeah. film. I, I didn't want to say VHS right away because I just don't know if people even have VCRs anymore. I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. just I'm getting old here. I feel I've like got you, I've got one. I've okay, got one. Then maybe mm -hmm. we gotta do that for you. And then um these last two tiers you get like a zoom call with me and the serial man and then you get a t-shirt or a sweater and then you also get uh credited as serial lord in the <laughs> no. And this one, you have five thousand dollars. This is the biggest uh, reward: is you get to be credited as a serial god in the opening credits, <laughs> and you get a handmade you get a handmade serial crown mailed to you as well. So, That's uh, cool. <laughs> I don't. I tried to include everything I possibly could. I, I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what I'm missing in terms of I'm trying to give everything we could to, for the for the rewards. Um, Oh, one of the one of the uh, tiers too. You can come on set too if you mm -hmm. want to come. Oh, that's cool. Too. You can see the I got some uh, gifts inside of the uh, in our uh, breakdown here of him mm -hmm. forever eating cereal. And then here's just another you know graphics of the rewards. Um, yeah, but if you if you scroll way up here, I, I don't know if that's RJ or you scrolling there, Damascus. But if you scroll way yeah. up, that's uh, RJ. Okay, if you scroll way way to the top there, there's like some of the stuff like the uh, you know some breakdowns. This the synopsis. Mm -hmm. There's a video, a five minute video that gives some uh, background. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of like I, I didn't, I did everything short of posting the whole script on, on this thing. I do have a, it's interesting actually. I do a lot of treatments as like a director mm -hmm. and um, you know, like the sound design, for example, if you click that page, uh, you mm -hmm. can scroll up a little bit. If you skip, click the uh, sound design page, it'll open a link to like a, oh, cool. a, a playlist on YouTube of oh, cool. and musical inspiration. And you can see here, I, I listen to a lot of movie soundtracks. I love Resident mm -hmm. Evil, obviously, a lot of the music from that. Uh, you know, Jerry Goldsmith's soundtrack from... Oh, Games. yeah. Uh, some newer stuff that too. guy that guy did some of the best soundtracks ever right oh, there he's great i love i i love jerry goldsmith okay like mm -hmm. don't even get me started on him uh i'm a big video game fan so you can see a lot of uh inspiration mm -hmm. i think comes from that um and some different soundtracks there uh so yeah like i i usually when i write i or working on treatments i i will find music that kind of gets me in the zone and uh i have actually on on the deform lunchbox youtube channel i have a it's pub, a public called deform lunchbox inspiration music and it's i don't know some 50 odd songs that i always put on on shuffle if i'm writing or coming up with stuff so i mean this movie's mm -hmm. been really planned like you know, it's interesting on Kickstarter, you got to kind of, uh, it's almost like a public facing treatment, if you will, where I have mm -hmm. way more pages written and, and breakdowns and, you know, a full script and a full budget breakdown mm -hmm. and things that are not maybe was kind of dragged down the public presentation. Um, mm -hmm. you, can see, you can see there, like you said, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that's one of our, right. Um, how much for shreddies? Eh? Um, well, mm -hmm. I will say, I will say, you know, this, in this, the movie, he's only eating with Cheerios, or he's only feeding with Cheerios, but there's going to be a lot of different cereal types. I hadn't thought of Shreddies yet, though. You know, maybe we got to get some Shreddies. And there's also the Shreddies, the, the big Shreddy. I don't know what they call it. You know when you just get the big Shreddy in the bowl? I remember you know, those. Like, yeah, like, it's like yeah, something yeah. our dads used to do, right? Like, Yeah. I haven't seen those in forever. But I remember those. Yeah, so maybe he's got to use some of that. I, uh, the hard thing is I, I don't know like the legality of using certain cereals. I don't know if we'll actually be able to use uh, Lucky Charms uh, in the movie. Mm -hmm. I know Cheerios and Corn Flakes we can get away with because they're generic, but we mm -hmm. might need to find a bag of marshmallows and mix it in with another cereal because I just don't, I don't know, or I just talked to a lawyer um, figure out that's okay. <laughs> but um, if yeah. you go out, uh, talk about the, the reference titles there. Uh, we got uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Wrong Turn. Um, and the, the thing, the one that interested me the most was uh, The Thin Red Line. Yeah, okay, um, so I, I, I'll speak to that. I, I've been watching a lot mm -hmm. of uh, Terrence Malick. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I got found down a rabbit hole. And I, I really like his, I, I mean, I, I'll admit that I've seen his movies in the past, and I was kind of like, I don't get this. Mm -hmm. uh, now when I watch him, I kind of watch him in a different mindset, right? I'm watching him in a more meditative sense where it's like, mm -hmm. okay, it's more like I'm getting this kind of collage of uh, experience versus mm -hmm. plot driven. And I really like, like that. And I think when I saw Skin and Marink and I kind of opened my eyes to what a horror movie could even be, I was like, well, hey, I think there's something kind of Terrence Malicky about that. And mm -hmm. um, come on, come on's on there as well. That's another movie where, and I think the main the main things with those movies do that I really like is they're very driven by interviews. Mm -hmm. and, and Thin Red Line, you'll there's a lot of like there's some battle scenes, and there, it, there is a plot that happens. There's different characters, but there is kind of this audio that's kind of speaking throughout it. And um, right. I wanted to incorporate a little bit of that in Serial Man, not not like overwhelmingly. Uh, I still want to have like the plot, and, and it is a slasher in a lot of ways. But mm -hmm. it's got kind of this, they're going to have these interviews with people. And you kind of get a sense of that in the short film where it's interviewing this lady about her son going missing. Cool. And her son is one of the victims of the Serial Man. So you're going to get this mm -hmm. kind of these little clippets of interviews. Like let's say while he's walking to, I won't reveal, he's walking somewhere to do something. Mm -hmm. And while you're seeing a mock, maybe we'll start to get a little of the, this little clips of interviews of, of, you know, someone who's missing their son because the serial man killed him. Or it's someone who, you know, uh, for example, how he got the serial, uh, it was, mm -hmm. I'll just reveal a little bit. It's, it was a raw, his parents robbed a serial truck. So you're uh -huh. hear a radio broadcast about the serial truck, uh, having been robbed and the driver having been brutally killed while we're seeing him walk into the cellar to get the cereal. So there'll be this kind of um, 
little bit of mix of media that way. Uh, and I think there'll be a little bit of a puzzle where you'll watch, you know, kind of like who who's talking and who's how does that relate to this character and um, kind of these interesting, weird techniques. And, and the other thing is, you know, the budget is we're looking for, uh, at least in Canada dollars, 33000 I think. And mm -hmm. it seems like a lot. But for a feature film, that's really not a lot at all. Um, we'd right. be using the tax credits in Canada to pay the cast and crew, and it'd still be like, I, I wouldn't get paid anything. I'd be doing all the post-production. Uh, and that cost basically goes to things like, you know, small crew, cast, and in front of the camera. Locations, mm -hmm. hundreds, hundred boxes of cereal, props, art, makeup, like the things you see. Um, so... I guess what my point is that we're going to have to do a few things technique wise to get around the big budget things you're, you're used to, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Things like using some of these different styles of, of filmmaking and technique like thin red line mm -hmm. or come on, come on, I think will enhance the, enhance it, but also give it a, a different style, but also uh, it allows us to do something. It allows us to put all, more of our effort into what is there, like the, the slashing, the kills, the, scenery mm -hmm. that, that you do see versus trying to bite off more than we can chew for that budget you know i understand it's a low right. budget it's not there's not gonna be any explosions uh mm -hmm. really no cgi uh it's very yeah. thank very god low <laughs> yeah I, think I love practical effects in my horror movies actually there'll be tons I'm of practical old. and if you watch our, some of the shorts on our channel you see we do lots of practical effects mm -hmm. uh, and you know i i i do a lot of the editing myself or i do I do all the editing. So I always think about uh, what the angles will be in, in the edit. So things like if, if it's a wide shot, you don't need, you can use strawberry jam for blood because Excellent. you're not close up enough to really know or see the seeds of the strawberries. So mm -hmm. Little things like that. Uh, and I, we work with, a, I have a great makeup artist I work with. Her name's Melissa. And her and I, we were, we're always talking about uh, what the actual shot is. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's the angle we're seeing it. And, uh, if you watch some of our stuff, you know, she's done wicked work. I mean, we did one called Shirts versus Skins where a guy's getting his, his back skinned off. And, you know, we we find a way to work together, me and her, where we're, we really don't have a lot of budget. We're not using crazy prosthetics, but mm -hmm. it's in the way you shoot it. And if we know right. exactly the angle and the deliberacy of how we're shooting it and, and being smart about cutting away at the right times, but also showing people what they want to see sometimes, which is the gore. Uh, it's just about kind of working around limitations and, um, yeah, I love, I love working around limitations. Like I really, I think this would be so fun to make. I don't, I don't think this movie could be the same if we did have a, a big budget. I think if it was shot, people have said, well, we'll shoot it on 4k, shoot it widescreen, shoot it this way. And it's like, well, I don't think it'll have that same feeling of being a old mm -hmm. lo-fi found footage. This could be really happening feeling. So Anyways. I would agree with that because uh, a lot of a lot of my favorite uh, old school horror films they didn't have big budgets like it, and they had to accommodate with a good story because they didn't have lots of money for effects and whatnot. Like I mean, if you look back, like the original Night of Living Dead, they were they were winging that right there. But I mean, it's yeah. it's perfect. The story is perfect, and it just uh, every shot is done well, and you don't even notice the low budget. You're just enwrapped with the story and when what's going on. Absolutely. Like you, you mentioned Texas Chainsaw Master. Like that was a super mm -hmm. low budget. And oh, yeah. um, how many sequels have they made with higher budgets? And right. uh, remake, remake. The original mm -hmm. still has this thing, right? This thing that makes it mm -hmm. so freaking creepy. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I really like, I like sometimes working around limitations. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love James Wan movies, big budget. Mm -hmm. Conjuring or Megan, like I like his stuff, but it's just a very different type of movie than this kind of. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to call it more niche, but it's like it's more for a very specific type of horror fanatic, like you or I, that likes likes this kind of stuff. Where I think the mm -hmm. general audience that tip, dips their toe into horror once a year and watches like something like Smile, which I really like, mm -hmm. right. they don't. They might not be into this kind of movie. It's, it's made for a very specific specific audience. It is uh, true. But I, you know, I was going to say, I, I agree. I think story, characters and story are important. But the other thing that's really important is theme. Mm. And oh, yeah. Sure there's uh, an actual kind of, uh, 
there's like a no, point say, like, going on. No, yeah, like yeah, I don't want to say a message because that feels mm -hmm. a bit pretentious, but um, some sort of thematic thing that ties the story and like what why is the scene what does this scene have to do with the overall picture of the the movie? What are these characters saying that ties into it? And there's we have a lot of strong themes in, in this film. Uh, it's themes of like loneliness and trauma, and it really is like it, in a lot of ways it's an examination of loneliness. Mm -hmm. Serial man, he's a lonely guy. He's left alone as a kid, and um, he's trying to fulfill that loneliness. He's not just killing people. He's yeah. just he's trying to actually find people to he, he kidnaps people to keep him company, really. Um, right, but he just doesn't know uh, how to treat them. <laughs> well, there is some, uh, there's some link there to like real life serial killers because Jeffrey Dahmer was noted. Uh, one of the reasons that he would like keep the bodies around is because he didn't want the people to leave. So there is, there yeah. is um, a thing with that. True, and you know, and, I did and, just watch that Jeffrey Dahmer series on Netflix, mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. it's all in here. Right. And uh, Ed Gein was, uh, he was another, that's another uh, uh, picture of loneliness, like right there. That guy was, he was on his own after his uh, crazy mother died, and uh, it yeah. just all kind of just happened. Just, we got a question, we got a question from JR here. What locations okay. do you have in mind to film? Uh, you know, I should have included a little locations page on the, the thing, mm -hmm. but uh, actually, it's, it's like cottage country. The mm -hmm. movie takes place in, in Mississippi uh, in a very small town. I uh, I put I have the name, I wrote it down, but it's actually the smallest town in Mississippi. It's only got 50 people. Um, so it's how he's able to get away with this, uh, living mm -hmm. out, out of the sticks. He lives almost like in a cottage. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how no one catches him. <laughs> uh -huh. And so, uh, anti-establishmentarianism. Oh, is that even a real word? <laughs> <laughs> it is now. It feels like a double negative to be anti decent to decent decent est. Oh, no, jeez, I can't say it. <laughs> anti de establishment. <laughs> oh, oh, I like that. De establish be to establish. So it's established. <laughs> Terrorism? Yes, the answer is yes. It is. It's just that exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's go back in time a little bit. What kind of kid were you uh, growing up? And what uh, led you to want to be a filmmaker in the first place? Um, geez, what kind of kid was I? I was probably a bad mm -hmm. kid. Um, <laughs> I, um, I really liked horror as a kid, that's for sure. I liked weird mm -hmm. things. Um, but I got, I got really into video games. Uh, I mm -hmm. love video games a lot, actually. Um, and I really wanted to make them. Uh, and mm -hmm. I loved, I loved, when I grew up, I loved Resident Evil. I loved Silent Hill. I loved Eternal Darkness. Uh, I love mm -hmm. these games. Like I just, I got, I just was so into, um, and I, I don't know how I was allowed to play them so young, to be honest, but I guess Blockbuster didn't care what you rented. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to make video games was the truth. And I took a programming course in high school and then I started to like research like what the job entailed. And I, I just mm -hmm. realized I'm like, this is not for me. Um, <laughs> it, it was, it's, it's for one, it's really hard. It, I have a mm -hmm. lot of respect for video game developers because it's so much work. And also it's just a lot of time in front of your computer. And I famously, they, they crunch, they do crunch time before a game comes out or it's, Kind of the scaling back on that now, but I mean, they would spend mm -hmm. like eighty-hour weeks in their studios, and I also, at the same time, in high school, was taking a course called communications tech, and mm -hmm. we got to make short films, and so we got our hands on our camcorders, and you know, we used Sony Vegas to edit, and mm -hmm. I got to, we got to make movies, and I made this little like gangster movie where I had two friends that were like killing each other and stabbing each other. <laughs> And I just, we got a really high grade on it and everyone in the class really liked it. And I'm like, man, this, this is way easier than video games because all you got to do is tell people to go in front of a camera and do it. Where in video games, you got to program, you got to have AI, you got to have, it's such a huge thing. And I'm like, wow, with film, you really can just make the scene happen and you can live the scene out. And there's something really organic about that. Uh, and I started working in the industry and I've been, I've, I've always worked in film. I went to film school and I work as a DIT now and an editor and, um, yeah, it's just film, film. I just love, I love it. Like film set is my place. Uh, so I just kind of, since I was 19, I just gravitated towards being on set. And then I don't know, some years ago I started making these short films and, 
Okay, let's see. Is it anti the movement to de-establish the Anglican Church as the state church of England? Wow. <laughs> I don't know. That's a bit much for me. Uh, <laughs> um, I would say, you know what? You know, funny. I mean, I don't usually like to take on. Uh, I'm not. I'm not very religious. I will say. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't usually like to take. Uh, I usually like to have the themes of religion, especially anti-religion, in the movies. Mm -hmm. I write and make, but I, I wouldn't say it's as directly uh, stated as, you know, what was it, in England and the Catholic Church yeah. hold on them. It, it's not that direct because it takes place in Mississippi. But right. there is, there is a, I will say there is a character in the movie who's like going door to door, kind of trying, a little kid who's trying to mm -hmm. uh, promote his church and raise money for his mm -hmm. church. And then he, of course, you know, kidnaps the kid and uh, ties him up and keeps him in his face. And um, so, so there are, it does, the theme, uh, I guess a little bit of theme of, of religion comes into that, um, but not in the way you might think. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not as po pointed. I think, uh, I'm, I'm actually really interested to know what people think of that character and what happens to him. But I will say that, no, I'm not going to say that. I mean, that's too much of a spoiler. I got to hold myself back. No, I won't say what I was going to say. Okay. Okay, so we've talked about low budgets and uh, how you can work around those. Well, let's go in the opposite direction. Let's say a, a major Hollywood studio dumps two hundred million dollar budget in your lab. What kind of movie would you make? Two hundred million? Yeah, something huge, just like I yeah. would make two hundred one million dollar movies. <laughs> uh, no, two hundred million. Jeez, you know what? So, okay, I will tell you actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Go to our YouTube channel. We during COVID when we couldn't mm -hmm. do as much filming, we started to make fan trailers. You should check mm -hmm. them out. They're really fun because I like to I like to edit. I needed something to do, so we edited like a Batman versus Jason trailer. Oh, cool! And it, was, it was cool. We just took That's scenes from Jason, oh, yeah. and we did some compositing. We did some voiceover mm -hmm. recording to like make it seem like a real movie. Mm -hmm. And it got, it got over a hundred thousand views. And then we did another one that was Indiana Jones versus Hellraiser, Pinhead. Mm -hmm. Oh, so cool. he finds the oh god, what's it called the uh, the Domnicronicon thing, and he unlocks mm -hmm. it, and it's India, and it's a mix of Indiana Jones footage and that. And we we've done all sorts of ones. We did Tomb Raider and the Descent. We did mm -hmm. Mission Impossible Terminator. We're working on a new oh, one cool. right now. Um, so if I had two hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. I would. I mean, if Harrison Ford is still alive, I would wildly want to make that Indiana Jones Hellraiser spin crossover, or. <laughs> Or I would really like to make a uh, what's the other one? Is a Halloween? We did a Halloween X Files, so X Files mm -hmm. case by the wires, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it got a lot. Of, it got a lot of buzz. It got over two hundred thousand views on Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. I, that'd be really cool, and get Molly and Scolder in there, and have them investigating Michael Myers, and like really tie it over. I, I think these types of crossovers where it's mm -hmm. Horror and not horror. So yeah, if I had two hundred million for one, it'd have to be a franchise movie, right? We, I can't make an original. That's not how mm -hmm. that works anymore. You know, no one's right. two hundred million dollars for a non-franchise. That's just reality. So mm -hmm. I think buying a really cool horror franchise, especially one that, to be frank, has like kind of fallen off. Like, mm -hmm. I think Halloween's been okay, but you know, J where's Jason? I don't know. That's in some sort of legal. Yeah, problem. that one's tied up in legal legal hell. I think right now. Yeah, and um, you know. Uh, the descent. The descent isn't getting a sequel. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that movie. That was good. The sequel's yeah. okay, but the first one's classic. Uh, and I think some of these characters coming back. We did Freddy versus um, Freddy Krueger versus Harry Potter. So <laughs> I think bringing some of these icons back in a really cool spinoff would be freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I do see. something. I do something similar on my Instagram page. I'll have the, uh, these games, well, uh, movie mashup games, where people add like, uh, I'll be like, add one movie to another movie, and then like describe the plot. And uh, one of like an example I did was was uh, Titanic with Jaws. You like uh, even like even that. a big even a bigger boat couldn't save them. You know what I'm saying? I would love like a ridiculous crossover, like two hundred million dollars Titanic with Jaws would be wicked. <laughs> Yeah, JR's asking these questions. I like this. I like this yeah, guy, JR. Yeah. Okay, or woman. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, the comment about 200 small films is interesting and professional. How does Peter feel about Canada giving the CBC 1.5 billion a year and creating virtually no good Canadian movies? <laughs> you know what? I did. I have seen a couple good Canadian movies recently. Actually, uh, there uh, was uh, Brandon Cronenberg's uh, Infinity Pool. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know if that was CBC, but it was definitely our our Canadian government agency funding body. Uh, especially considering millions a year in taxes go to TV programs Canadians actually watch, but they're filmed in Toronto, but set in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not like the film industry is a little funny in Canada. Um, we don't mm -hmm. have a big studio system here. So right. like a lot, we're actually a fairly small country. So like a lot of smaller countries mm -hmm. are, we have like a government grant granting agency that like supports our film industry. Mm -hmm. um, so in some ways that, that, that's tough because, um, unless you're, an, uh, especially with horror, like horror is not a friend, a uh, type of genre that a government agency would necessarily choose to support because, you know, right. you support it and all of a sudden people's getting their faces skinned off mm -hmm. and not look so good for the people who are paying, paying that. that I, and I kind of, I do understand that a little bit, even though, you know, Brandon Cronenberg gets funding, but he's David Cronenberg's son. So as an up and coming horror filmmaker, and I will say I've applied for so many grants in Canada, I can't even count how many, and mm -hmm. I've never gotten anything. And I've always, if I'll, I've been true to making a horror film, making something scary. I don't, I don't try to pander. I don't really make dramatic films or comedy. I'm very much, I like movies that are messed up and scary. Mm -hmm. That's just not, not what I've been. I'm not having any luck down that path. Right. So that's why I'm trying to do Kickstarter truly and that's why i'm trying to do it by my own do my own youtube channel like i've, I've do, done it with my own money for this much time uh and if to be honest if this kickstarter doesn't get the money i'm gonna make a feature film with my own money anyways i'm just gonna go for <laughs> but i will say the one nice thing that we do have in canada is that so if if we do if i do make this movie uh serial man and mm -hmm. i hire a, ca a cast or a crew and let's say we pay them you know per day the the Canadian government will uh, reimburse me for some of the labor costs, so mm -hmm. that's that's why a lot of big films are made here, like uh, Pacific Rim or The Shape of right. Water or The Boys or uh, mm -hmm. Handmaid's Tale. Like we have a lot of big shows here, but they a lot of these productions from other countries will come here because of that Canadian tax credit. And mm -hmm. the nice thing is, even there's an up north tax credit. So um, you know, in Canada, we're very focused around our cities. But if you right. go way, way out of the city, like you go to like, you know, I want to say the sticks or, mm -hmm. you know, the trees or not, not quite, but like way up north, they have right. additional tax credits so that it inspires filmmaking in those small towns. So hmm. it's actually a really good thing. I can't speak to the CBC thing, uh, even though I like, I like CBC because they made Schitt's Creek. Mm -hmm. It's a good show. Right. Uh, and they make some good game shows <laughs> that I get jobs mm -hmm. on. So they hire me. So I got, I, I'm not gonna, but um, yeah, I, I Canada, it's, it's, it is what it is. It's, it is hard though with horror to get horror films off the ground with uh, government agencies, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but it's also the biggest genre. It's the most popular genre, you know? True. So it's the oldest genre. If you really think about it, it goes way back to uh, um, um, stone age days. Cavemen yeah. huddled around the campfire telling scary stories and stuff. So. Fear is HP right? Lovecraft. HP Lovecraft was right. Like uh, fear is the oldest uh, emotion of mankind. So. You know what? You're, 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 it really is right. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Even animals know fear, and and the interesting with fear is that where something like comedy, if you, if I make a comedy film, it might be funny for uh, uh, North Some America. People. English, right. North American speaking, who we, you know, but it's not funny overseas because mm -hmm. they, they don't have the same sense of humor, or they don't even speak English, and the and the kind of the sarcasm is lost. But mm -hmm. horror is is universal, mm -hmm. and we on D, our channel D from Lunchbox, we have a huge audience in India and in the Philippines. We get mm -hmm. our films always uh, captioned, uh, translated mm -hmm. captioned, so that you can watch in closed captions um, because the horror is just universal. And that's the beauty of the genre is that even something like Serial Man, I believe in Japan and Europe and Philippines and, and Brazil, mm -hmm. like they will like this film a lot because Definitely. fear is a primal thing. Being killed and having your life ended, especially in a, in a not so good way, mm -hmm. is a primal, mm -hmm. primal thing, right? So Exactly. I've, I've actually watched movies like foreign foreign horror films, like uh, the French movie Inside. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, haven't, I haven't seen that one. I think I've heard but in, oh, great movie though. But I've like watched I've watched it in French. I've never actually watched an English dub version of the movie. But I don't actually have to because you can un I can understand everything that's going on 
because again, as you say, it's not like about comedy or anything. It's it's a it's a, a woman invades uh, a pregnant woman's apartment and tries to steal her baby, the unborn baby, out of her. And uh, the movie the movie is insane. I mean, you need to see wow. this. Thing. I mean, it, it, it's it's from the same uh, uh, French uh, extreme horror movement that Martyrs was in. Oh no, kidding. Um, okay, so, I, I yeah. Love Martyr. That's my movie. That movie. So uh, it's in this. It's in the same vein, and it's just it's just insane. Um, but I didn't. I I've never felt the urge to watch it in English because. D- dubbing, I can so understand. Or a dubbed man. I, I did it yeah. recently. It was a movie called Piggy. Uh, this I think Italian mm-hmm. film and um, mm-hmm. decent. Good movie, but the dubbing took took me out of it a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Just because the English doesn't, I don't know. It sounds funny. Um, <laughs> Jr., how scared are you as a Canadian filmmaker? You're talking about CBC funding. Um, well, <laughs> I feel like this guy's Jr. is really has a has a beef to pick with CBC here. <laughs> um, you know what? Truth be told, CBC. I've worked on a lot of CBC shows uh, myself. Mm-hmm. In Toronto, so I mean, I'm kind of happy that they exist because I, I've worked on game shows with them and reality shows. Um, <laughs> so I, I just uh, speak to like funding aid bodies or anything like that, or uh, mm-hmm. what have you. But um, I definitely don't want CBC to go away. Um, uh, so I mean, there's a lot of Canadians watching this. There are a lot more Canucks in the speech control boat than just brian casters right uh i don't know man i don't want to speak to all these controversial topics man like <laughs> i don't know man I, i'm not i'm not very um like i don't know i don't want to get involved in political stuff it's a drag of course i want to make horror movies yeah. you know everybody yeah. likes horror movies okay and if you don't like horror movies it's because they cause such a reaction for you that you just mm-hmm. that you do really like it you just can't handle it and you just don't know right. you like it Right, so let's steer away from the serious stuff and have some fun. Okay, I call this I I call this section of the ever show the lightning round. Oh. It's basically like free association. Ask a question, you just just you think about it, blurt out whatever. Okay, okay. All time favorite movie. Uh, Children of Men. Oh, that's a good movie. I, I have like a list. That. I have a top hundred list, so it's the number one right now. Yeah, that's a good one though. I like that. I like how that movie ends. I, 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 that's really good. Just uh. I almost like quiet, perfect. almost like that quiet meditative thing you're talking about. Like uh, everyone's like, you know, the two sides are all shooting at each other, and all of a sudden they hear the baby crying, and all of a sudden they're just like, like, whoa, okay. So that scene gets me every time, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love it. Okay, all time favorite horror movie. Uh, I don't know what's on my list right now, but it's probably a tie between The Shining and uh, The Thing, nineteen, the remake, oh. movie, the uh, John Carpenter one. Yeah. The the thing the original thing with Rob Botton's effects, man. Well, the original I don't know. Thing, the original thing is from the forties or something, right? The, well, yeah, yeah, the original one, the original okay. one, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right, right. I I, I called the original one the John Carpenter one because uh, they made the remake sequel in like 2011. Pre- so I was thinking, well, I think it is. Right. You know what? I yeah. gotta say, I rewatched the prequel recently. It's not bad. It's not bad. Mm-hmm. It's just it's missing that practical effects. It's too much. Yeah. CG, and that was the big problem with mm-hmm. it. They went to CG on it, but when the head, when that that head scene, the the, the cash head scene, man, I mean, it's like, for the first time I saw that, I was like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that movie's amazing effects, but also it's just the characters, right? It's the scary mm-hmm. thing is that you don't know who to trust, and mm-hmm. even, even to this day, you can talk about the very ending and who is the which one of them is the thing, mm-hmm. or either of them is one of them does he share the bottle and the bottle is that like there's so many different ways to read that ending and i just i love that type of stuff in movies that makes you think and question mm-hmm. i love it a lot I'm right watching. favorite guilty pleasure movie you know the one that's not that good but that you love anyway uh i love anything with gerard butler so i gotta say the uh london has fallen or mm-hmm. uh, london on uh Angel has fallen, and there's another one. Uh, DC Washington has fallen. DC has fallen. Maybe is that's called. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but pretty much anything with Jared Butler. He's. Uh, I just. I don't know. I just love his movies. They're guilty pleasure, and and they're not. They're not necessarily amazing movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they are. If you love, it, if you love a movie, it doesn't matter. You you love it, right? I mean, I, you know, he has this thing where he captures uh, the man, the rage of man, so mm-hmm. well. But he also mm-hmm. like, knows how to be the nice guy too. And he just something about that mix really 
It's awesome. I don't know. Right. One movie that you just can't stand. Um, geez, I try to burn out all the memories of the movies I can't stand. <laughs> um, I, to be honest with you, I don't care for the Harry Potter series at all. I don't care about wizards. Yeah. Uh, I think kid, kid wizards. And I know, you know, people might hate me for saying this. And my girlfriend loves Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. uh, I've tried to, I've read the, one of the books. I've tried to, whatever, play the games. I've tried to uh, watch the movies. And I just, there's something about magical stuff that doesn't, mm -hmm. that type of magic, it, it makes me cringe. And it's like, they use silly magic to get into problems. Like it's silly magic to get out of problems. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. If you were given fifty thousand dollars to remake any short film you ever saw, what would it be? That's a good question. Wow. Well, okay. Well, to be honest, if I got fifty thousand, I'd probably want to make a feature film version out of one of our short films, the one that we made for our channel. But there is, I will just as it says, you ever saw one of the one of my favorite short films that I ever saw was called Tea Time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's a it's a I'm horror. Not on it's i think it's a horror film it's some sort of psychological film uh it's on youtube and it's about a lady who's just making tea but as she's making tea and she like opens the cover there's like a decapitated head there and then she <laughs> closes it she just i don't know you gotta watch it it's it's really good it's honestly actually it's amazing um there's mm -hmm. people have done videos that study this short film i think that this mm -hmm. short film would be an amazing feature uh and it's simple but it's so creepy uh yeah tea time baby mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Favorite TV show all time. I gotta say The Wire, but I love my like, guilty pleasure is The Office. <laughs> I don't know why. British, British, the British or the American Office? The American, Which one? The American. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I know some people yeah. are purists on both sides. I just I it was on, it was one of those shows that was on during the time that like I. It was airing mm -hmm. while I was watching it, so I like felt mm -hmm. really connected to the characters and um, just the way they kind of do this thing where they they soften you up with comedy, and then when they get the emotion, they hit you with the emotion. That's something I try to mm -hmm. carry into the scripts that I write, where you, you soften the you soften people up with characters, and then it hits harder when you, in my case, kill them. So there's a okay. I don't know. Have you ever heard of this show? I have this. A friend of mine swears by this show. He lives in Canada. Um, he's we grew up together in Missouri, but he lives in Canada. Uh, there's a show called Todd and the Book of Evil, I think. Uh, Canadian show, I've never even heard of that. Uh, I've never seen it, but he swears he swears that this show is like great, it's like horror comedy. But okay. I've never seen it. Uh, I thought he was gonna say Trailer Park Boys. Have you ever seen that show? I've heard of that one. I've heard of that one. Before. I love <laughs> Trailer Park Boys, is hilarious. It's great. I've seen part of the movie, I think. Real far forth the movie. Yeah. I mean, I would skip the movie because uh, even mm -hmm. I believe the director even said the movie wasn't he wasn't happy with it because it was too high budget and he liked the mm -hmm. low budget feeling of it. But it's just it's basically these guys in a trailer park are always trying to come up with schemes of how to how to get rich. Mm -hmm. And everything from like stealing barbecues to um, planting hash or finding yeah. it, it's so funny. I don't know. I love it. I love it. All right. Okay. What are your five favorite musical performers? Oh, geez, musical performers? I don't know about this one. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm like kind of a loser with music. Um, <laughs> I, like you enjoy it? I like Hall & Oates. Mm -hmm. I like a lot of movie scores. Uh, mm -hmm. I really like, you know, Ennio Morricone. Uh, Morricone. I really like Jerry Goldsmith. Um, I listen to, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a loser. I listen to classical music and, and stuff. I mean, I like, it's not a loser. I, I like pop music, I guess. I like rock mm -hmm. music. Um, but I don't know. I'm not, I don't really have like a list of, of bands that way. Right. Justin Bieber. Okay. Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Favorite food. Right now I got to say quesadillas. Oh, cool. Favorite junk food. Oh, geez. Um, well, I gotta say, we have this thing in Canada called poutine. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of this? No, no, no. So this is what I don't understand. I don't understand why Americans don't adopt this food. So it's it's just French fries mm -hmm. with cheese curds and beef gravy on top. Ooh. It's it's That's amazing. But it's like a it's like a staple here. Like our McDonald's has it. Huh. 
Like our, our first teams all have it, but it, it's never mm-hmm. been adopted in the U.S. And I, I mean, and here's the thing: I've come to the U.S. and I've seen it on some menus. I was mm-hmm. in Kansas City or something, and I saw it on a menu there. And they use it like Tex-Mex shredded cheese. It's, uh. it's not quite the same. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, we have a poutine beaver tail food truck that comes through once a month. So oh, in that yeah. one, beaver tail is another Canadian thing. It's like a fried dough with. Um, mm-hmm. Chocolate and banana. Ah, yeah. So I, I gotta say, poutine is my favorite junk food for sure. Mm-hmm. Love Kevin Smith, by the way. So yeah. Know. All right. Now, now this one ties into cereal, man. What's your favorite breakfast cereal? Uh, well, this has changed throughout my life. Uh, I'd say for a lot of years it was Apple Jacks or, or Apple mm-hmm. Cinnamon Cheerios, but uh, I love Fruity Pebbles. Mm-hmm. I don't know yeah. if you have that anymore. Like I, I'm, a, I grew up in the yeah, States. yeah. Um, I've seen, I've, yeah, I've, I've seen Fruity Pebbles. Yeah, um, we don't that. have Fruity Pebbles in Canada. You have to go to like yeah. a specialty store for it. Um, yeah. But it's freaking amazing. The problem is I don't buy it. Uh, we I've seen it in stores because I'll eat the whole bowl in one, mm-hmm. bowl, and then I'll yeah. feel sleepy. <laughs> so I try not to buy. I only buy the healthy cereal because if I buy the good, the really good, even Lucky Charms or uh, Fruit Loops, I can mm-hmm. eat the whole bowl in one night and I'll feel sick. So, ah. <laughs> so that's yeah, yeah that's what and in the movie cereal man, he's gonna throw up. He carries a bucket with him where he throws up from overeating cereal. <laughs> so this one ties into it also. Which real life cereal killer case disturbs you the most? You know, uh, what's his name? Gacy, right? Um, mm-hmm. That was a clown. Um, yeah, that that really disturbed me. Um, and he like lured lured young people to his home. Um, yep. Yeah, that I would. I mean, I think the classic answer would be like Jeffrey Dahmer, but uh, no, mm-hmm. I think it's the Gacy serial killer. What's his name? Uh, was it William? John. Uh, Lee. John. John, John, Lee John Gacy. Lee Gacy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was really mm-hmm. disturbing. But we've had a couple serial killings now in, in Canada, mm-hmm. um, and those are pretty disturbing. We have Bruce MacArthur was k- killing people. Mm-hmm. For- years he'll probably make a movie about him one day mm-hmm. uh, I, I honestly i get i think a serial killer is what is described as more than killing th- more than three people right right that's right uh, to be honest i'm really disturbed by any any mass shooting where it's like someone just goes and shoots a bunch of people for no reason and mm-hmm. uh, that like disturbs me to my core that that's happening and people mm-hmm. are doing that and and for purpose no reason so uh mm-hmm. that any type of that any more re- any of the recent mass shootings is probably the most thing that disturbs me the most i would agree with that yeah they've also mass shootings have almost seemed to have supplanted uh like serial killings almost if you think about it like they've know, like you know and i think the thing, the thing with um classic serial killers is a lot of them went for like the society's lowest type of people they'd go for prostitutes or they'd go for poor right. people so it, it's easy to forget that forget that like mm-hmm. those people it's easy to feel as scared where then mm-hmm. you think about a modern day school shooter and they're going into a school full of children with freaking, you know, assault rifles. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's real scary. Like that's so scary. Oh, yeah. I, I don't even think I could ever make a movie about that. Um, and I know some people have, I know, you know, Gus mm-hmm. Vincent, Elephant was one. Elephant, yes. Um, and there's Incendies and there, like, I like watching those movies because they they're so scary and real to me, but I don't think I can mm-hmm. ever touch that subject matter. I think that's a step too far. I like to be a little more fictional, if you will. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You wake up in the last movie you watched. How do you fare? God, I watched so many movies. What was the last movie I watched? Um, I watched this more. I watched John Q yesterday. Oh, <laughs> it was on Tubi, okay? Uh, mm-hmm. So I watched John Q. That's not a bad movie. It's a great movie. Uh, and actually, yeah, it's I, it's the movie. second time I've seen it, I saw it in theaters when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a good movie. Uh, it really is. Mm-hmm. It's very, like, you know, about healthcare. We have health, free healthcare in Canada. I know you guys don't in the mm-hmm. States. And it really right. is a, a compelling argument for why you should have free healthcare. But <laughs> um, it's John, I mean, Denzel Washington, man, he's great. Love him. Okay. Good movie. Yeah, how how would I fare in that movie? I, I don't know. Yeah. I'd probably be like John Q. You know, do your thing, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're stranded on a deserted island. What three things do you bring with you? Um, well, there's probably some survival things I should bring, right? Like uh, <laughs> a boat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd probably bring. 
using a um, some sort of satellite router with internet, mm -hmm. and then I'd bring like a smartphone or a laptop so I could contact people and they could mm -hmm. find. And then the third thing I'd bring would probably be like a big pack of food. Okay. Sounds good. I'd just be thinking about survival, man. I, I wouldn't be thinking about having fun on that island, like you know. <laughs> okay. If you were a superhero. What would be your code name, your superpower, and who would be your arch nemesis? Mm, super peer, superpower. Um, arch nemesis too, man. This is like I gotta think about this one. I'd probably want to be able to fly. I think mm -hmm. I, just, I just would think flying would be so fun. Uh, what would my name be? Probably uh, Flying Pete. <laughs> That's good. I don't know. And, and the marriage nemesis would probably be someone who um, couldn't fly, but probably someone who was maybe obsessed with birds. Maybe they had a lot <laughs> where they infected birds and they were they tried they needed to learn how to fly and they realized I could fly and they're like, I gotta catch this guy and I gotta dissect him. Figure out. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Which, you know what you know what I always thought would be really cool? Like a mashup. I've never really seen like a superhero horror story, like where, where they like put them together. That's a good one. You know? actually. Yeah, I mean, we have the boys. They got Watchmen. They've mm -hmm. got some sort of alt. Uh, yeah. Not really. Uh, yeah, you're right. You could do that. like people. You, someone could come up with a, a decent superhero horror story. You could do that. Somebody you could know do what? That. Do you like video games? Have you ever played the Castlevania games? Yes. So I guess in my mind, Castlevania is a little bit of, of that. Hmm. Uh, oh, I've, I've read DC. Um, but Castlevania, like, you know, they're fighting Dracula and they've got power mm -hmm. and they're fighting kind of all sorts of tropes of uh, horror. So there's mm -hmm. a little bit of a superhero vibe of horror there. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting if... Um, I don't know how that would work, though. I mean, it's like it's kind of like with horror... There's like vulnerability involved, mm -hmm. and if you have superpowers, how vulnerable? It's almost like if if there's, you know, a lot of horror. I guess the villain would have superpowers, Dracula. Right. But if there's a superhero there, it kind of might take the fear out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of goes back to that some of those mashups where if you have yeah, Bright Brightburn, good example right yeah. here. Uh, I really like that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, Yep, Castlevania was great too. The, yeah. the two on Netflix, uh, really awesome, well animated. But you're right, Brightburn is kind of that. Have you seen Brightburn? Yeah, I guess Brightburn yeah, yeah. is kind of that mashup of horror mm -hmm. and yeah. you got superpowers. There's also another one. Um, it's called Chronicle. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's for, it's a found footage where these three teenagers like find. I can't remember. I saw it so long ago, and they they get mm -hmm. powers. But one of them is like, I'm gonna use this for not not goodness. I'm gonna fuck. Them. Whoops! I'm gonna mm -hmm. you know bleep around, and then the other <laughs> stop them, uh, and that's kind of I guess, and also the boys that has a little bit of like sinister superheroes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. All right. Choose one of these: Silence of the Lambs, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or Seven. The original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, for sure. I like those other two too. Uh, I I almost mm -hmm. don't consider uh, Sons of the Lambs a horror. It's more like a psychological thriller. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I'm I'm odd. I don't. Seven is not one of my favorite movies. It's not on my top mm -hmm. one fifty list. Uh, I don't know. I don't love that movie. I think it's very overrated. Mm -hmm. Okay. You meet thirteen year old Peter Hatch. What advice do you give the younger you? I would say you got to invest stock in Apple right now. <laughs> right now, boy, <laughs> you gotta get rich. You do this. And, and honestly, I'd be like, the moment you hear about Bitcoin, <laughs> get on that. Because uh, then I'd have, then I'd be a billionaire, and I'd be able to make all these awesome movies. So, right. Okay, you find that genie's lamp. What three things do you wish for? I would wish for everyone watching this podcast to invest and pledge for Serial Man. <laughs> That'd be the first thing. Uh, no, I guess the uh, three things I would wish for, uh, geez, I mean, I'd probably wish for the ability to fly. I already mentioned mm -hmm. that. I'd probably wish for, like, you know, world peace, something like that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. no world peace. Uh, and then the third one might be, um, 
I mean, I probably got to be a little more selfish with the third one. I'd probably say I'd want to have my own, my unlimited goals of life would be to have unlimited uh, creative freedom and mm -hmm. unlimited financial freedom. But I think the financial freedom gives you creative freedom. So I would have, I would wish for unlimited financial freedom. Very good. Most vague way I can say, give me lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what's next for deformed lunchbox in general? In general, like, okay. like, mm -hmm. well, I mean, right now we're hoping that uh, Zero Man gets going. If, if this Kickstarter goes well, it's, I got to go all hands on deck on that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, got, there, I won't have time to make a lot of other short films in the meantime. Uh, luckily, we are getting a couple short films from other filmmakers that send them in, um, but. Mm -hmm uh it really it really right now it does depend a lot on how this kickstarter goes um i will say though at the same time i am working on another film which is a feature film uh, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit different i don't want to tell you too much about it but i am going to start shooting it uh it's going to be a long long-term process uh and it's going to be a film that's kind of based on you know just almost like a series of nightmares mm -hmm. uh, it's truly to be kind of Silent hill -y, really demented and scary. But I think in general, um, we're going to be focusing on trying to do bigger films, uh, longer films, feature films. And if we do do another short film, uh, it'll probably be either something something that is a little longer, does have mm -hmm. a little more meat on the bone. We've done a lot of the short shorts, like the, the two to three minute shorts, a lot of mm -hmm. it because of budget uh, and it's just you want to shoot, you have one day to shoot, you have one day with the crew and the camera and everything, and you make the most of it. But I think, um, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting old, right? Like I got to make some, I want to make a big movie, uh, made over 50 short films. So, mm -hmm. um, let's see, Ahem, you were given a hundred million us dollars to make a Canadian film for the Canadian market. What would the film be about? And what would it look like? Well, I would make freaking serial man It'd be a hundred million dollar movie. Um, <laughs> I, I would definitely make a horror film. 100 million is so much money again it, it'd probably have to be something that ties into franchises at that point and mm -hmm. i would try to petition to get some two classic franchises and mash them together but and i would i honestly for 100 million horror movies don't get 100 million dollars so i i might even be more conservative and say 100 million let me make 10 horror movies that are 10 million and i have i will tell you right now i have a lot of horror movies written i've written so many scripts feature length scripts uh, I've got over 10 scripts. I got one about scissors. I've got one called unnamed babies. I've got one about, um, called making some eggs. I've got mm -hmm. so many different scripts written. So I probably just try to make all of those because I think they're, I think they're good movies. I think like, I write them to be entertained myself. So. Alpha flight. I don't know. <laughs> no, alpha flight. Alpha flight was a team of Canadian superheroes that Marvel published. They were, uh, they started in the 80s, I think. It oh, okay, Puck. I get you. It was like, yeah, there was Puck and North Star. I think North Star. Was North Star in uh, Alpha Flight, I think? You know what? I hate to say it, but I mean, I'm Canadian. I'm a dual mm -hmm. citizen. I'm American and Canadian. I live in Canada. Mm -hmm. And this is going to sound bad, but if something is inherently Canadian, mm -hmm. it comes across as low budget. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know if someone in, in, in the States is going to see like, oh, this Canadian, Canadian, mm -hmm. uh, pure, pure Canada hero thing. They're Wolverine. Just, you know, like, you got Wolverine. Wolverine. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Vindicator, Sasquatch, North Star, Fox, Wolverine's Aurora, American. Yeah. American. I know he's from Canada. <laughs> or whatever, but, um, I, you know what? Sasquatch they've movie. Done so much, they've done so much stuff with Wolverine. Like, Okay, he was originally Canadian. He's mostly American. And then during the eighties and nineties, there was uh, he was in Japan a lot. So it's like you know they just they just mixing everything in there with him. I know. I don't yeah. know if he's truly Canadian, but um, <laughs> I, I know that like in general, I mean, it's nice to be Canadian in Canadian film. But like if you don't, I don't know if you'd want to make your movie be very super Canadian in its branding, um, just because it. I don't know. Has a has a has a at least in Canada it seems to have like a bit of a connotation of being low budget. That's why a lot of films in Canada are, are uh, they like take place in New York. Like we'll shoot in Toronto, they'll take place in New York. Or and for like The Last of Us, they shoot in Calgary, but it's really the states. So mm -hmm. you know, right. So any shout outs you want to give to anyone? 
before before we finish tonight. Yeah, I got I got to give a shout out to my two uh, buddies, Julian Backlow and Michael Mastrkovich, who are the actors in Serial Man, uh, the short film. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the feature film has a lot of actors in it. And also, I, uh, Rachel, who did the voiceover. Um, so these three got two, three people helped bring this kind of short film together. Um, yeah, that, that's the top two of them right there. That's Julian and, and Michael, the top two on the left. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's a, I've worked with all these people before, uh, mostly. Um, like eight out of them I've worked with, including the skeleton. Um, but yeah, Ju Julian's been huge with this man. Yeah, he, uh, he has gone an extra mile. You saw him walking in bare feet in the snow, and he's eaten a lot of cereal, and he's uh, helped promote this thing. And I honestly couldn't have done this whole kind of thing without him uh, being by my side and, and uh, motivating me to do it. There's been times where I'm like, ah, I don't know, I don't know if this is gonna happen. I don't know if we can do it. And he's like, Yeah, you can, man. We can do this. We can do this. So and he's he's so talented, man. He's in he's in a few of our other shorts as well. He's such a talented actor. I feel like he's gonna blow up. He's getting all sorts of commercials up here. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, my, I gotta give a shout out to Julian Backlow and Michael. The next one, he's he put duct tape on his face and gotten his underwear <laughs> and, and poured milk poured on his face. And he's he's a great actor. He's someone who will always go the extra mile. Um, and I. I really want to, I really hope we can make this movie, man. These, these guys are so great. These actors are so great. And there's so, so much crazy stuff happens in this movie and these actors are going to go the extra mile to make it, make it go crazy. So, um, I got to shout out those guys right there. And, you know, Danny, I got to shout out my, my buddy, Danny Menlo. Uh, he's mm -hmm. helping me promote this whole thing. He's motivating me. He's, uh, kind of, you know, I make movies, but he, he knows more about this whole thing of social media, crowdfunding, all that kind of stuff. So, He's he's been the strategist about all this. Um, I think he's even the he's probably the reason I'm I'm even here right now because I don't know if I would have even reached out and done this if he didn't uh, push me to do it. So, right, excellent. Okay, well, thank you, Peter, you for being on the show tonight. You have been an excellent guest, and I look forward to having you on the show again when uh, Zero Man is made and comes out because I would love to interview you, cast and crew, and just come back on the show and have some fun. Um, and uh, to everyone out there, uh, check out Deformed Lunchbox's Kickstarter page, pitch in some cash if you're interested. And if you enjoyed tonight's show, like, share, and subscribe on Critical Blast. Good night, everyone. Thanks for having me, man. I'm